You're tuned in to the Dakota Housing Network on Super Talk 1270 and supertalk1270.com. In-depth discussion and analysis of real estate issues nationwide and those issues unique to our area. Our team of experts includes Joe Sheehan, Greg Larson, Dave Floor, Brian Ritter, and a great variety of guests. The Dakota Housing Network begins now on Super Talk 1270 and supertalk1270.com. And good morning. My name is Greg Larson. I am with you, and with me is the Dave, inimitable... Dave Floor, Mr. Housing, right here. Mr. Housing. And our special guests today will be Scott Davis of the North Dakota uh, Indian Affairs Commission. He is the big kahuna, as we say. And joining us shortly will be Jewel Burnett of First Tribal Lending. Today we're going to talk we, we about... We even bring people from out of state on... Oh, yeah, you know, sure. Mr. Burnett's from South Dakota. He's from Sioux Falls and uh, has a, he's like a walking encyclopedia of finance. Is he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'd like and, to see him do that. Yeah. Walk and <laughs> walk and recite encycl- the encyclopedia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, in studio with us is, is uh, Scott Davis. Scott, welcome to the show. Uh, we have talked before and uh, we think this is an important subject for folks to know that there are things moving in the uh, Indian nation with Native Americans in North Dakota uh, and and housing and issues like that. And you have been one of the driving forces in that. And thank you for that. Well, thank you, Greg. And uh, (laughs) where do you go, Scott? All right. Thank you, Greg and uh, David for, for, for time today too. And uh, also thank uh, Jewel for uh, joining us today too, all the way from South Dakota. But uh, you know, uh, my six years as as commissioner for Indian Affairs in our state has been um, been a, a, a very uh, uh, blessed uh, ride, I, I should say, but also challenges, a lot of challenges on the way. So, you know, uh, coming from back home and, and watching things, uh, the opportunities and also the challenges back home, one of the biggest challenges has always been housing. You know, how do we get adequate housing? for uh, my tribal members, my relatives back home. And, uh, and so that's been, been you know, part of my, my duties as commissioner in finding a, a, uni- uni- a unique way to, to do that. Because predominantly over the over decades, you know, housing really works in maybe one or two ways. It's, it's HUD housing appropriated by, by Congress to the tribes to build X amount of houses each year or every other year, whatever it may be. So it's really dependent upon uh, the federal budget, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge to our tribes, and it's it's continued that way for decades. And so we're trying to find out new new ways to uh, to bring to, to to bring incentives to the tribes, but also how do you do uh, business loans, housing loans on tribal lands, which is unique as well. And that's the value of having uh, Mr. Uh, Jula Burnett here as well. He'll explain in depth of that too. So so those are the things what we're doing here as of late. Good. You know, we've talked about this a couple of times, Scott. Um, when I was a kid, a little kid, my grandfather had uh, two ranches in North Dakota, and, and uh, in- interestingly, both of them boarded a, a reservation. So I, I got to know a lot of, of uh, folks on and off the reservation, became good friends, still good friends today. But it seems to me, back in the 50s and 60s, most predominantly 60s in my memory, it was a lot easier for folks to get into a house then than it is now. Is that bureaucracy that's changed? or? Yeah, well, I think one of it is our population growth. We're the fasting yeah. minority population growth in, in our state. You know, we've been that way for, for a while, uh, and we're going to continue that way. If you look at the U.S. Census, our, our North Dakota census is, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're a fast-growing population. <clears throat> Compound that with uh, the tighter budgets in, in Washington, uh, you know, so you're finding that uh, those budgets, population growth, kind of colliding, and uh, really creating a housing, uh, a very housing uh, problem for for Indian country here in North Dakota too. So, the other thing is too is um, it's very challenging to do uh, loans on trust lands. There's a lot of, as you said, uh, bureaucracy to that. You know, I, I've worked, uh, had conversations with uh, gratuity land programs here in the state. Uh, you know, whenever you're doing a, a home package, and, uh, and I use the example of my wife and I, you know, when we bought our home here in Mandan here uh, a few years back, it was pretty simple, I would say, uh, because of the uh, the fee status, the, the taxable status, the uh, just the land itself. It's pretty simple. So there was a probably a uh, very, uh, uh, I guess, how can I say, uh, from a... Um, 
um, real estate from from your perspective pretty cut and dry. This is you know this is this is how we do it. Well, on the travel side, it's different. It's really different, and not too many people have that niche on how to do those things because it takes a long time, and it kind of drives, in my opinion, my personal opinion. It drives business away because of the, the bureaucracy of that, okay. too. Well, I, I can interrupt you for just a second. For the listeners, fee status means that you pay cash for land and you own it. There's not a middleman involved. And that's how almost all real estate is done on private lands. It's a fee simple or fee status uh, type of deal. So that's what you're talking about. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And, I, I, you know, Scott, I think you're right. I mean, North Dakota Housing, we were involved in doing – uh, loans on trust lands that we would buy them, the lenders would originate it. But eventually the, the lenders just fell away from it because of issues with dealing with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and that, but then also right. just the lack of business, uh, you know, the amount. And then the more business they had on just regular loans, fee simple loans, you know, you know, it's easier to do this than to do this one that's more complicated over here. And that, that's just, you know, that's the nature of business, I think, is you're going to try and find the path of least resistance, so to speak. It is. And I think, you know, when I look at the sovereignty of our tribes, um, and I've had candid conversations with tribal leaders about this, is sovereignty is sovereignty. I mean, for, 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 for me, I, I totally understand that <clears throat> and where sovereignty comes from. But the other thing is, in the world of business, you know, we're all bound by universal business laws, transaction, banking laws, <clears throat> finance laws, and so forth. And so a lot of times our sovereignty does not trump that. Just because it's your sovereign doesn't mean that you're, you're, you, you can trump certain business laws. You know? So when a bank comes to, to town wanting to do business, you know, are the rules the same or are they different? Yeah. And that's where I'm coming from. <clears throat> and I, think, I know that's where Jules is coming from is, is we have to create a friendly economic financial climate for our tribes. Where business people, where investors want to come in and say, "Hey, your your laws are no different than our laws," mm-hmm. you know, and because again, those are just the, I guess, the fundamental rules of of business, banking, home mortgages, and so yeah. forth. So. And you you've done some stuff to address that as far as trying to get it easier for businesses to come to the reservations and and do business and stuff, right? You've, well, I think uh, to uh, Standing Rock's point, uh, they passed their uniform yeah. commercial code. Yeah. That was one I've been working very, very hard on uh, over the last, I'd say, four years in partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank, bringing in other tribes from Montana, the Crow Tribe, uh, Crow Nation out of Montana, the Chippewa Cree Tribe in Montana, the Oglala Tribe and Cheyenne River Tribes from South Dakota, and also the, uh, I think it's the White Earth Band in Minnesota, <clears throat> all have uh, executed or, excuse me, uh, uh, implemented their UCC code in partnership with the Secretary of State. What does that mean? It creates a, a transparency, a, a window where investors can look in and see what, what, what's being, what type of business climate is being conducted on the reservation. Mm-hmm. So it, it levels a playing field a little bit. It gives investors and bankers uh, a level of comfort. And so those are, again, the, the laws, the, uh, the environment that we're trying to create with, with our tribes. And, and it all leads to housing. Yeah. Uh, I know we had a couple... Uh, uh, thoughts uh, tribes had a couple thoughts about doing some proposed bills and from a banking standpoint now that the UCC is passed on Santa Rock this really opens a door for for a lot of things so but again you just can't have a UCC code sitting on the shelf you need to exercise that you need to put mm-hmm. that UCC into action and I think part of this part of what we're trying to do here with housing is going to do that yeah because hey, you know if you can get business rolling on a reservation, that's only going to help with the housing because people are going to have good quality jobs. That's it. That's the key, and jobs. That, and that's, Absolutely. that's, you know, it all fits together. And it's private market. In my opinion, yeah. a lot of it is private because predominantly everything is kind of owned and controlled by tribal government. And that's a good thing. But we, we need a huge, large, large, more sector of private private business yeah. and home, home ownership. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, we're we're going to take a break. Okay, we'll be back with Scott Davis and uh, hopefully Jewel Burnett is going to be able to get on the phone here when we get come back.
And we are back with the Dakota Housing Network. I'm Greg Larson here with Dave Fleur and our guest Scott Davis. And joining us now is Jewel Burnett, the manager of First Tribal Lending. Welcome, Jewel. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yep. Jewel has uh, joined us late because he was doing the daddy thing, which in my way of thinking is more important than talking on the radio anyway. So, oh, really? Thank you, Jewel. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, We've been talking about uh, housing on the reservation, and uh, Scott has talked about some of the difficulties. Can you give us just an overview, Joel, of uh, how you play into that? First of all, I guess we should know what First Tribal Lending is. Sure. Um, First Tribal Lending is a mortgage company that specializes in providing the HUD Section 184 Indian Home Loan Program, which is a specific mortgage program that was designed for Native Americans to use um, came about back in 1992, created by Congress um, to try and entice lenders and bring in mortgage capital to the reservations on trust lands. So that's something that First Tribal um, is basically uh, specializing in. Um, we deal with Native Americans nationwide, trying to uh, build or buy homes on, on or off the reservation. Okay. Very good. Uh, and the, and the, the the real key, Jewel, the, this is Dave, um, is that you're, you know, we talked a little bit in the first segment about how hard it is for lenders, the typical mortgage lender, to do business on a reservation with trust land or whatever because they don't do a lot of it. So they don't, you know, they don't have the process in place necessarily where you're the expert. This is what you do day in, day out. You know the hurdles and, and how to work through that. And that's really this is one place where, you know, boy, specialization like you have is, is really important. Right. And, you know, back when I got into banking and, and I, you know, I don't want to date myself here, but I was in high school when I started in the bank in my hometown in Mission, South Dakota. But the bank there was, was unique in the stat in the fact that they were doing deals on trust land for mortgages for the local tribal members before this program even came into existence. Mm. So I kind of had a head, head start a little bit on, you know, what it took to get a deal done on the reservation on trust land. So when the 184 program came into existence, the guy that hired me just seen a good fit and, you know, uh, brought me on board and, and we took off running from there. But um, it is a challenge. It is not, it's not easy by any sense, uh, um, but we have created a lot of partnerships with the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, to try and get these trust land deals, you know, streamlined if, if you could the best we can. I've been involved in transactions that it's taken me four plus years to get documents from the government so my tribal member can, can build a home on his trust land. And then it took another four plus years to get the documents back and record it so I can get my guarantee from the HUD office. That is not the case in every circumstance, and we've come a long way since then, but we still have a lot of work to do um, across the nation on reservations due to the housing shortage and the population growth and stuff like that that's going on on our reservations um, to provide homes and, and uh, roofs over people's heads that choose to live on trust land. So that's something that uh, I'm very in tune with. Uh, my team has created a niche for themselves to, to become experts in, in this process and develop relationships across the country with different agencies of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There are a lot of good people that work at the Bureau of Indian Affairs that have partnered with us and and come to the table to, to try and get stuff done in a timely fashion. So we work on trust land transactions as hard as we can to make sure that that tribal member has every opportunity to, to build or to buy that home that's on that piece of land that they're choosing to live on on the reservation. Okay, and Jewel, when you say across the country, you mean across the country, not like a couple of states, right? Yeah, we're, we've done deals in 33 different states um, for about 140 different uh, tribes. So, you know, we, we, don't, uh, we don't care where the trust land transaction is coming from, and that's kind of how we built our reputation with the HUD office, too, that, you know, we, we've uh, dug in and, and you know, shown everybody that, you know, we're interested in doing these things and we're not going to back down. So the HUD office has kind of seen that over the last 16, 17 years. So if they've got a tribal member calling from a specific part of the country that can't find a local lender to help them out, you know, HUD's been pretty gracious and saying hey give these guys a call they'll they'll do what they can for you okay you know i, I know that's true because uh, one of our other hosts joe sheehan uh, as you know is uh, involved in mortgages with cornerstone bank 
And uh, he says anytime he has a, uh, a native uh, customer who can qualify for this loan, he refers them to you. So uh, you must know what you're doing a little bit anyway. Well, and that's, you know, guys like Joe, um, we can't appreciate them enough because one of the biggest things that kind of burns in my belly a little bit is in, uh, the little thing called informed choice or maybe fair lending. Um, we got a lot of Native Americans out there that maybe have been put into the wrong product, if you will. Um, so lenders that are out there across the country, you know, just doing their everyday job, you know, get a lot of calls from different lenders and different entities saying, geez, we didn't even know this program existed. Well, that's fine and dandy, but once you do find out that it does exist and you know that it is the best product for that for that person, that's really where you should steer them to instead of taking them down another path into another product that probably isn't the best thing for them. So guys like Joe that are aware of us and they refer business to us, we really appreciate that, and we have a lot of those types of relationships across the country, and we continue to build on those every day. So you and Scott work pretty closely together, I would assume, Um Probably a weekly conversation between the two of you. Well, we're uh, we're getting there, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, speaking of housing, too, we have a large manufacturing plant up in Belcourt that uh, uh, now uh, a company called U.S. Container and Homes has uh, has uh, is is doing business up there. And uh, there's a few hiccups uh, going on right now, trying to get it started. They built one home up there. Uh, it was in the papers. Uh, they're going to continue to build more homes uh, through through that partnership, but also uh, you know they need assistance with marketing it, you know. And what Jill and I are trying to uh, to do is help them in assisting that. If you want a home, they have one to build. There is X amount of floor plans you can pick from. Uh, you need financing, call Jewel. Uh, you need a builder, we have a builder. So we're trying to package all that. But ultimately, creating jobs with that manufacturing plant, you know. So again, these these homes are not just uh, uh, for sale, just for travel people. It's for everybody across the nation too. So so we'll be working on that here. But uh, the big thing is that I've been telling people in Indian country that if you need financing for for your home, if you're on or off the reservation, call Jewel Burnett. You know, mm-hmm. my wife and I are a product of the HUD 184 here in Mandan. We, we got into it, we lucked out, um, you know, because we didn't have $20,000 later on for a down payment. We just didn't have it. What HUD helped out with uh, was about 15 of that. We came up with 5,000, you know, did all the numbers, uh, we got in, uh, and it's really helped me in Mandan. Now I'm a, you know, bona fide taxpayer of Mandan, you know, with a nice home. Uh, yeah, glad to have you too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's something to point out with the 184 program is that you know, we're we're talking about we were talking trust land, but it's available across the whole state of North this Dakota, Mandan, Fargo, right. wherever. If you're a tribal member, you can yeah. access this program and yeah. buy a house in Mandan, like you you exactly. and your wife did. And it, as Jewel said, it is a it is a great option for a Native American yeah. uh, tribal member, yeah. and yeah. that's where if they're if they can use it, that's where they should go. Um, the other yeah, thing you it, don't. You don't have to be a tribal member from the state of North Dakota either. If yeah. you're a tribal member from another state, another tribe, you can use it anywhere in the state of North Dakota. So that's the nice thing about it. Yeah. Um, it, you know, another thing, Jewel, too, to point out is that, you know, this is not a handout. I mean, when Scott took that loan out, I mean, he paid a fee up front uh, for the insurance on this because he didn't have a 20% down payment. So this is a self supporting insurance fund, basically. A, that's protecting lenders against default if that would ever happen. So it, it, this is not, it's not a handout. People are paying for this. I call it a hand up. <laughs> hand up. There you, you know, go. Yeah. You know, some of the, the, our veterans have programs like that. Exactly. But, yep. You know, uh, yep. other programs are out there too. But, you know, and I encourage anybody who's got any type of program, I don't care if you're native or non-native, you know, take take advantage of it because it, it really helped us. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's been, been a blessing. I'll be honest with you. It's, my family's happy, as as Jill and I and most of us here, we're fathers. My kids are happy. My family's happy. Yeah. You know, and, and again, we're a solid contribute to our city. You know, we're taxpayers. We, we, we do all that. And it also provided business for, 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 for your colleagues, too, for the real estate agents, too, of, uh, of our state, too. So it's it's a, yeah. really a win-win for everybody. It's expanding the market Absolutely. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's okay. a level playing field. I love that about yeah. it. 
Well, we're headed into a break. Uh, when we come back, Jewel, we're going to talk about your program, what it takes to qualify, and some of those things. So we'll see you shortly. Great. Welcome back. We're here with Dakota Housing Network. I'm Greg Larson. Next to me is the wonderful and beautiful... <laughs> Holy cow. Greg. Uh, Dave Floor here. Okay. Well, he's wonderful. I, well, nobody's called handsome. me... Handsome. handsome. There, nobody's there called me beautiful, Greg. <laughs> Not even my wife. I was speaking of your mind. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, I, they made a movie about me. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, okay. And uh, Scott Davis and Jewel Burnett. Scott is with the North Dakota Indian Affairs Commission. Jewel Burnett is with First Tribal Lending. When we left, we were going to talk to you, Jewel, about what it takes to qualify for a HUD-184 uh, loan. Can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. Um, nice thing about the 184 program and why it was developed, like I said before, was to bring mortgage capital to the to the Indian reservations across the nation, specifically on trust land. So there was a couple special characteristics when it first came out that made it you know, really uh, an attractive program and, and made it a little bit easier to, to accomplish that. One is it's not credit score driven, so we don't care about your credit score, and that still is the case today. We don't care what your credit score is, and the reason why they created a program that doesn't deal with credit score is because we see a very common issue across any country with, with medical collections. Indian Health Service is supposed to be providing free medical service across the country for, for Native Americans um, on the reservation, so sometimes when the Indian Health Clinic or hospital can't help the tribal member for the specific need that they're having, um, like major surgeries and stuff, they're, they're referred out to regional hospitals in the local towns or cities. So sometimes those bills don't get paid on time or uh, not paid at all unless, you know, the tribal member or the tribe pushes it. Um, and also IHS is funded by the government, so, you know, the funds that flow through IHS are, are limited also. So Sometimes medical collections pop up on people's credit history, and that, that obviously is a, a hurdle in trying to get you know, a mortgage loan done in a normal circumstance. So for that reason, there's no credit score. Uh, it's not a credit score-driven program, so we're able to jump around that a little bit. Number two is the down payment is uh, lower. Um, for anything over $50,000, it's 2.25%. Uh, $50,000 and under, it's 1.25%. The down payment and closing costs can come from a tribal down payment program. Um, before November of last year, there was no PMI insurance associated with this program. As of November 14th of last year, they instituted a small PMI premium at 0.15%. So the PMI rate on, on this loan is far less than, per se, the FHA or the conventional world. So what we're looking at, and the program works the 41% debt-to-income ratio, so we're looking at the people's credit history and determining what their minimum payments are out there and what their gross monthly income is, and we're determining what they appear to qualify for in a max mortgage amount. Um, the 184 program does also have max mortgage limits per state and per county, so a lot of our people on the reservations aren't building or buying a house over 271000 so those mortgage limits are, are pretty much... Uh, uh, tolerable or they, they, they accommodate us for what most people are trying to do on the reservations. It's in those high cost areas on the coast for our, for our tribal members located in California and on the East Coast that have a little bit of troubles uh, with the mortgage limits because of the high cost of living on the coast and the max mortgage limits that are out and set forth by HUD um, within those areas. Okay, so, so the program is really a, a nice program um, from that standpoint of those characteristics that differentiates itself from like FHA. I think your FHA program today is 3.5% down, and I think your PMI premium is 0.85 if I'm correct, but I could be wrong You're there. You're correct. But it's a much, it's a much affordable, more affordable program for the tribal member. And when we're talking deals on trust land, one of the nicest things about the program, so we don't have a market on most of our reservations. We're building markets there. So when we talk about appraisals, when we're building a house or having a manufactured home or a modular home put on the reservation, we don't have to use the comparable sale approach in the appraisal world. And when you talk to an appraiser about that, it'll, it'll probably make you do cartwheels because that's not normal. <laughs> what they allow us to do with the new 184 program is a cost approach appraisal if there are no comps available in the area. So that's been a big factor in building these markets on the reservation because there are no comparable sales typically on our reservations, especially on trust land. 
that's I will been tell a big you, benefit Jewel, to us. I'll tell you, Jewel, as a realtor, I would love that appraisal method uh, to be universal. That's just a great thing. So you said your max uh, mortgage is two seventy one. That's the same as VA, and I think it's pretty close to you guys, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Yep. So um, the point here is, it's uh, it because it isn't credit driven doesn't mean it's free. It means you still have to prove your ability to pay. Uh, you're just using different standards uh, on how to reach that ability to pay. Is that correct? That is correct. We're looking at the last two years of your credit history pretty pretty hard. So if you have any outstanding judgments, collections, charges off accounts, things like that, all that kind of stuff is going to come into play. So if it's not a medical bill and you have a charges off account or some other type of collection, those types of things have to be paid before we can take the next step. So it's just not something that just because the credit score isn't taken into consideration, credit does matter. And of course, you want to be able, you have to be able to afford what you're trying to get into. 41% debt to income ratio at the it's a one ratio. It's not a front end back, front end back end ratio. It's one solid ratio. Um, you don't want the entire forty one percent of your income going towards your mortgage payment because then it doesn't leave you any room for other debts like car payments, credit cards, things like that. So we got to be careful on uh, looking at you know the credit. A lot of people call in upset because they said, "Well, they said credit doesn't matter." No, credit score doesn't matter. But your credit does matter. So what's happened in the last two years or what's existing out there for derogatory credit that's what we have to address before we can take you to the next step okay okay we're i think just about ready for our next break no we got oh we have oh, three, three minutes, minutes. okay so i got a question ahead. go ahead okay jewel um now we're you mentioned you know it's got a lower down payment requirement for the program um the the cost of the mortgage insurance is cheaper you're going to have people out there that would say well you know, that, that's just asking for trouble. You know, the people that think everybody should have a 20% down, et cetera. Do you have any uh, knowledge of what is the delinquency foreclosure rates on the HUD 184 loans? I do. It's um, programmatically nationwide since the program's been in existence. Um, before the debacle and starting in 2008, it was less than 1%. And after, you know, current to date now, it's still less than 3% of the whole portfolio. So the portfolio is performing better than compared to the FHA portfolio. There you go. Okay. So, so it, yeah, it's a yeah. just great indicator that, you know, having a big down payment is not necessarily a requirement to have low default or delinquency right. rates. And one of the nice things about the program is why it was so insulated from what happened starting back in 2008 is it's always been a fixed rate program. Yep. We were never able to offer an adjustable rate program, so I think that was a lot of help, you know, in having that option being mandatory as far as a fixed rate versus being able to op- offer mm-hmm. those option arms and things like that. Yeah. Um, another thing, you're talking about credit, um, and you don't look at the credit score, but you're still looking at, you know, are, is the person paying their bills, you know, if they have a credit card, et cetera. Do you run into a lot of people that don't have the traditional credit? Like maybe they don't have a credit score can you look at alternative credit? That's a great question, and yes, um, we do run into quite a few people that, you know, typically we're a cash and carry culture. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that still don't trust banks, so they'll go and cash their check or get their deposit, and they'll just take all their money and just, you know, keep that in hand. And they don't like to finance things, so yeah, we can use non-traditional credit if the borrower does not have any credit at all. So if we can get three non-traditional credit sources, we can proceed and move forward with those about three non-traditional credit sources if there's absolutely so, no credit out there. What's an example of a non-traditional credit source? Um, sometimes people have charge accounts at the local grocery store, gas stations, things like that. Anybody who's extended them any type of credit, um, the local car dealership on the corner on the reservations, you know, you have these dealerships that sell, you know, uh, a lot of uh, used cars, and people will um, finance them with that local auto dealer there not have that traditional credit so they have a non-traditional reference within that dealership or that grocery store or the gas station so and then it also helps to get if you know your local telephone company or your electric company will provide you a nice letter saying yeah jewel pays his electric bill on time no late ever and things like that so okay sounds great well now we are headed into our break 
last segment. Last segment. And we're going to come back and kind of wrap things up and just get some information so uh, folks out here know what's going on. See you soon. Welcome back to the Housing, Housing Network. I am the... Uh, uh, You're the lovely Greg the Larson. The lovely Greg Larson. Okay. The wizard, we have the handsome the Scott Davis. And the handsome Scott Davis. And, well, we don't know what Jewel looks like. We, well, we, we know Jewel. We, we know what he looks like. He's handsome, too. Looks like. he's, the, he's the most interesting man in, in the country. There he's we go. The, he's okay. the head-turning man in Sioux Falls. So is he like the guy in the commercials? He is. He is, he's yeah. He's the Indian version of that. Yeah, okay. Exactly. All right. We all okay. know that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jewel, uh, now that you're blushing, and of course, since you're on the phone, we wouldn't know that. We're going to guess. Tell me just a little bit about where you go. Uh, I do have one specific question I'd like you to start with. If someone wants to buy some acreage uh, in the country and build a house on it, can you work with them on that? Or, or is your 271 limit on that? Or is that a different program? Or am I just wishing? No, you can do real properties. We we tend to not, not like things over twenty acres. So when we when we get into that, if you're buying, you know, we we do see trust land transactions that are twenty plus acres. You know, there's an eighty acre plot. We like to pinch those down, you know, to twenty acres or less. We don't like to take mortgages on anything over twenty acres. Not to say that we haven't, but HUD just kind of frowns upon that. And I think so would the BIA, especially. You know, the BIA does their job there to make sure that lenders aren't taking advantage of the tribal member and over-collateralizing, over-securing their, their notes. So if I have a tribal member that, you know, is borrowing $60,000 to put a, a double-eyed manufactured home out on his 80 acres, um, that 80 acres might be worth, you know, several thousand dollars, depending on where it's at, and we don't need to take the full 80 acres. So it is possible to use the program. Um, that's typically what we're doing. It's, I mean, we're doing, like I said, we're building markets, and most of our tribal members want to live out on their own land or their family's land or have a home site lease given to them by the tribe that's out in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And if we want to be on uh, fee land off reservation, you can still work with your clients? Same, same thing. Same and then, thing. of course, when you get off tr- tribal trust land and into simple land, then your comparable sales come into come and play a little bit harder because it is fee land, so they're going to look a little harder for fee simple comparable sales. But again, if they can't find them, HUD allows us to use the cost approach. Great, great. Sounds great. So uh, we're talking about tribal members. That is that universal across the country? Um, and I know the answer to the question, but I'd like to have you give it. Yeah, each tribe determines what their, what their uh, tribal enrollment uh, degree of Indian blood is. So we don't dictate, um, the, the lender or HUD doesn't dictate that. It's, if the tribe has, you know, uh, whatever the enrollment pos- uh, policy is, we respect that. So as long as they have a tribal ID card with enrollment number, they can use the program. So like, for example, the Cherokee Nation, they don't have a blood quantum requirement. They have a descendancy policy. So if your family was a descendant of the Cherokee tribe, they're just they just automatically enroll you with that kind of proof. But my tribe here in, in South Dakota, um, we have to be a quarter um, of Rosebud Sioux Tribe to be an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. So each tribe <clears throat> dictates what that is and what their membership enrollment requirements are. Okay, and that's pretty universal, I think, in the tribes in the Dakotas, isn't it? You have to be a quarter? Yeah, pretty yeah. much, pretty much. Because <clears throat> believe it or not, as blue-eyed and blonde-haired, well, when I used to have hair, it was blonde. Uh, as I am, uh, I'm a son of the American Revolution. You can go back to pre-revolutionary times in my family, and on my mother's side, uh, one of my relatives was widowed, and then he married a, a Pequot woman mm. in Connecticut. Yep. And I'm from that lineage, mm. and, and Pequot is like the Cherokee. So I could, if I wanted to, get a tribal membership card. Uh, I have chosen not to because, uh, for me, it kind of feels like cheating. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm not a pure descendant, and and uh, I, I, it's a small tribe. They don't have any reservation Plus, land. Your, your There's really is, no 
no good reason to. Uh, Your name is Lars Son. Lars Son, that's <laughs> correct. And that just does that sounds more Norwegian. Than <laughs> it does. Scandinavian. And, I, and, and this else. comes from yeah. the Penwarden McTavish. Side oh, of the okay. Family. Right. So it's Welsh, Scotch, okay. right. and uh, uh, this goes all the way back to well, the guy's name was Israel Putnam Hunt, mm. and he was in the Revolutionary War, and and uh, just prior to the war, he married and. Uh, so she was, uh, I think her, they, they always give him an English name. I think it was Margaret Hunt, as I recall. Mm. So there you go. But uh, It's good that you know your, your, yeah. the history of your, of your family. people, yeah. of your family. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's well, I, really important. I must confess I, I need to do some research on the Pequot tribe. I know very little about them, but mm. it would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Sure. So back to what we're talking about. You digress. A lot less about me. Yeah, you digress. <laughs> Jewel, how can someone get a hold of you? I know there's banks, as we talked about, that, that uh, refer you, but if if we do have a tribal member out here who's looking to be financed or a realtor who has this a is for all the realtors. That are Every listening realtor to who's this. listening to this, mm-hmm. pay attention to this. Yes, right. And I, I will point out to you realtors that Jewel will, Jewel will be at the uh, Convention of the Dakotas in uh, Brookings, not Brookings, Watertown, Watertown South yeah. Dakota, uh, in September, so you can all stop at his booth and get information from Absolutely him there. Absolutely, do it. But how can we get a hold of you, Jewel? By phone, my work cell is 605-496-5266. And for tribal members that want to do an online application, you can go directly to my website. My branch website is www.hud184loans.com. That's hud 184 L-O-A-N-S dot com. And if you click on the prequal button, go through the screens. As soon as you hit the minute, it comes to my email in about three seconds. And my team tries to get a response back to the tribal member within 48 hours. And for first tribal lending, it's it's first, as in it's not F-I-R-S-T. It's first of the abbreviation Number one. Yeah, the number number one. Yeah, yep. do the do number the Google, one. do the Google or Bing or whatever search thing you do, and you'll pop up. And and is your picture on there so everybody can see what who they're dealing with? It is. And All so right. Is my uh, my entire team that's out there. So I have Eric Sprinkle, Adam Hicks, and Nate Schmidt in my office that help originate the loans, and we have processors and yeah um, assistants in the office. So we have a full team here in Sioux Falls. Yeah. So it's not like you're, you know, even though we always, it's always good to go in and see somebody, you know, this is really a online, it works and they can talk to you. They can see what you look like. So they know who you're dealing, who they're dealing with. Yeah. And for, for the real estate companies that are out there listening, you know, I did this, um, I haven't done a lot of presentations to real estate groups, which is kind of, you know, funny if you think about it, but I'm willing, I, I travel quite a bit. So if you have a, a real estate agency that's wanting me to come in and do a presentation on the program, I'd be I'd be glad to do that. Okay, right. so Jewel, uh, I call in and, and I want to uh, start this procedure. What questions are you going to ask me, and uh, what are you going to tell us? You know, first of all, we start with your with your credit and your income. So we're going to talk to you about your credit. And we're going to talk to you about your income. Um, we need to verify that your your income's stable. Um, there's many different sources of, of income that come off the reservations. We have some per capita gaming income with some gaming tribes that that, that income can be used. But the biggest part is if you're employed and you're W-2 um, income type uh, borrower, then we're going to we're gonna ask uh, what your hourly wages or get your W-2s from you on a recent pay stub and determine what your income is and then take a look at your credit and cover that in detail with you. So those are the two main big, you know, the biggest hurdles. And then, of course, the education piece and just talking with the tribal member about the program and the steps in the mortgage process because the mortgage lending uh, world is really still new to our culture on the reservation, so we're doing a lot of education every day okay, and that's gonna, the program and steps. That's going to lead us into our close. Uh, Scott, what do you want to tell me about home ownership? Exactly, and Jules exactly right. The 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 I don't think there is a Lakota or Dakota word for ownership in our in our in our world. But what this done for for my family is created a, a feeling, uh, making it personal of of ownership. It's it's a different feeling. I, I tell you, uh, I know the, the the tribes are really stressed out with their housing authority departments for maintenance for etc. Kind of the d- dependency thinking, so to speak. But what uh, this does is create ownership. 
So I think in the, in, the, in everybody's world, ownership when you own something, you're you're gonna value that. You're gonna have a higher personal value to that, and that's what it's done for our family too. So, and it leads to other things. You know, the ownership of our cars, our homes, the ownership. It's really self sovereignty to me is what it really is too. So, really glad that uh, Jewel has this program out there. I encourage all the listeners out there to really uh, take a look at his, his website. Call him. Uh, utilize me to to uh, to get to him, whatever he may be. But there's a big opportunity out there for for us too as well. So uh, so anything we can do to help uh, you how guys out there? How do people here. get a hold of you, Scott? Uh, S J Davis at nd.gov. Uh, my office is right at the Capitol, first floor, and three two eight two four three two is my direct line. In North so. Dakota Indian Affairs Commission. Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. This is a subject I think we will revisit in the coming months to see how it's developing. And thank you so much for listening to the Dakota Housing Network.